The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. God begins a good work in you the moment you receive Christ. And He will complete it and bring it to its finish. God will never give up on you. And if you don't ever give up on Him, then you're going to get to the place that you want to be. What does it mean to be saved or to be born again? The Bible says, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Well, you know, being born again or being saved, receiving Christ as your Savior, doesn't just mean that you pray a sinner's prayer, get your sins forgiven, start going to church, read a little bit of the Bible, and do a few good works. It's a lot, lot, lot more than that. And I really think a lot of people think that becoming a Christian is about all these things that you're supposed to do now that are better than the things that you did before. And you will do better things, but you're not going to do them because that's your obligation. You're going to do them because you have a new nature, and that's what you want to do. A new nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away, and all things become new. Now, the interesting thing about this new nature that I think many times people don't understand, and it prevents them from being able to live the Christian life, even if they try, is that the new nature that God gives us is planted right in the middle of flesh. It's no different than if you'd take a seed and poke it down in the dirt. We come from dirt. We're going to return to dust. And God takes His nature, His spirit, and He puts it right in the middle of our flesh. So you might say when you're born again, you get another nature. It's a new nature, but it's another nature. And so you sometimes end up feeling kind of like two people. You don't want to do it, but you do it anyway. Or you want to do it, and you don't end up doing it. And you get confused, and then the devil sometimes lies to you and says, well, you know, you're not even saved. But the whole thing is, is to work with the Holy Spirit and feed that new nature, the Word of God, prayer, fellowshipping with God. Let's not overly spiritualize prayer. It's just talking to God. It's talking to Him. You don't have to get some spiritual voice when you pray. You just talk to God about everything and anything. To be born again doesn't mean that you now just have this little spiritual compartment of your life that you get out on Sunday morning for an hour and then kind of tuck it away till next Sunday morning. When you're truly born again, really born again, you let God invade your whole life. Amen? Your whole life. I spent a lot of years as a religious Christian. And although I was born again, and I believe with all my heart I would have gone to heaven if I would have died then, I really don't believe that my witness was good enough that I would have affected anybody else in a positive may, way and made them want what I wanted. So after we receive Christ, we do have a ministry. Everybody has the ministry of intercession and the ministry of reconciliation. And this ministry of reconciliation is largely worked out in us just being an example everywhere that we go. When you're born again, God gives you a new heart and He puts His Spirit in you. You even get a new mind. Romans calls it the mind of the Spirit. Sadly, you still have the mind of the flesh. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. So, we're in this thing now where before we just sinned and enjoyed it and it didn't bother us at all, but now we get this new nature and all of a sudden when we do wrong things, it bothers us. So now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to feed this new nature and work with the Holy Spirit until that new nature gets stronger than the old nature and stays stronger than the old nature. Amen? That's why we have this journey with God. We call it our walk 
with God. And it's amazing to me, after this many years of being a Christian, when I look back now at my journey. You know, if you've only been born again a couple of years and you don't know much about the journey yet, but it definitely is a journey. And the Bible says that God changes us as we study the Word, God changes us from glory to glory to glory. God begins a good work in you the moment you receive Christ, and He will complete it and bring it to its finish. God will never give up on you, and if you don't ever give up on Him, then you're going to get to the place that you want to be. When you're born again, you receive a seed in your spirit of everything that God is. You become pregnant, so to speak, with godliness. You know, most pregnant ladies, the beginning, you, you say, I'm pregnant, and people say, well, you don't look pregnant. Well, that's kind of the way it is when you're a new Christian. I mean, you can tell somebody about this wonderful thing that happened to you, but they may think, well, you don't look very saved to me, or you don't act very saved to me. And, uh, but I think it's an amazing thing to realize that when you're born again, you don't just get this command to go to church every Sunday, but you get a new nature. You become a new creature. God comes to live on the inside of you. Power is available to you. Everything in your life can change. There was no area that you can't have victory in. I can go sit in my garage for a month and that will never make me a car. And you can go sit in the church till Jesus comes back and that will not make you a Christian. In order to be a Christian, you must receive Christ sincerely into your heart. The Bible says you must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Jesus went to the cross for us. The only begotten Son of God, actually God Himself, came in human flesh, lived a life of perfection, taught His disciples, went to the cross, died for our sins, took all of our punishment, all of our sin, so every person that would ever believe in Him could have eternal life. And if you believe that and you're willing to, I think to confess it with your mouth is a little more than just saying a sinner's prayer. I think that if you really believe, if you really have faith, it's very hard to keep quiet about it and have no evidence. So I'm going to offer to pray with people right where you're at who want to receive Christ tonight. You've never made that decision. Maybe you came as a guest with somebody. Maybe you came, you watched me on TV, and you just wanted to come and see what I look like in person, what, you know, whatever, I, you know. <laughs> whatever God uses to get you here is fine with me. The point is, is now you're here. And it's for more than just to sit in a building. We're not here to put on a show. I do this for one reason, and that's because I believe that the Word of God changes people's lives. I've been completely, dramatically, radically changed over the last 34 years because of learning this and ordering my life according to it. And so, if you've never received Christ, or maybe you've tried to serve God and it's just the whole religious burden became too much for you and you thought, well, this don't work, it's too hard, and you backslid. And I, I actually believe somebody who has once received Christ and then is trying to ignore Him is more miserable than somebody who never received Him at all. Because when you don't have that new nature, you enjoy your sin. But once you get that new nature, you can't enjoy sin <laughs> anymore. And then in addition to that, I believe there's a lot of, everywhere we go, we find, and I'm sure it's this way too here, Jesus didn't die so you could have a religion. Jesus did not die so you could have a religion. So stop talking about your religion. Jesus died so we could all have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God through Him. He said, I am the way. He's the way to the Father. When Jesus died, there was a very thick veil in the Old Testament temple 
that hung between the Holy of Holies, which was the innermost part, and it separated that from the outer court, from the holy place, and then from the outer court. That temple kind of represents the way we are. We're body, soul, and spirit. God comes to live in that deepest part, just like God met with the high priest once a year in that holy of holies, but nobody could go in there except the high priest. Nobody could go in there but the high priest. And the day that Jesus died on the cross, I just read it again this week, the moment that he died, that curtain, that thick, several foot thick curtain that was way, way, way too high for any human to reach was ripped open from the top to the bottom. And what did that mean? The way is now open for the ordinary person to come into the presence of God and confess their sins and have their sins forgiven and have wonderful, rich fellowship with God. Please don't settle for just some Sunday morning religious experience. But be like Paul and say, my determined purpose is to know him and the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. So you've never been born again, you're backslidden, or I think there's just a whole lot of people who are churchgoers but have never truly been born again. You haven't really opened up your whole life to God and said, I surrender. So I just want to pray with people tonight. I am going to ask you to stand in just a moment if you want to receive this prayer tonight. And you say, well, I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, I'll be embarrassed. Well, you know, I just feel like you can't sneak into the kingdom. I mean, to be honest, if you won't stand up in here in front of these people who love you and are very happy for you if you make that decision, you'll never go out in the world and take a stand for Christ. And that's what we must do. We must learn to take a bold stand for Christ and not be ashamed of what we believe. So if you're here tonight, anywhere in the balconies, even if you're in the back, you're working here in the building, but you're hearing what I'm saying. If you've not received Christ as your Savior, you're backslidden, or you just say, you know, Joyce, I just, I just plain don't know, you know, I, I hope I'm saved, I want to be saved, I'm not sure I'll go to heaven. Why don't you just get it settled tonight that your salvation is never going to come because of works that you do, no matter how much church attendance you have. And, you know, I want you to go to church, but I want you to go because you want to, because of what God has done for you, not because you're trying to get little check marks with Him on your spiritual duty calendar. Amen? And read your Bible because it's the Word of God and it teaches you how to live, not because you think you get that, that you kind of satisfy or appease God. And I, I, I did all that. I read a chapter a day and acted like a jerk all day and, you know, then I'd say my little prayer every night and get up the next day and do it all over again, go to church on Sunday morning, go home, fight with my husband all week, go to church next Sunday, fight with my husband all week. I mean, there's a whole lot more to it than that. And there's a life available to you that comes out of a new nature. So if you want to pray with me tonight and make that very important decision, then why don't you just, as bold as you can be, just stand up with me right now and we're going to pray. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Now this is the way to get started. Amen. All right. Okay, now listen, we in the kingdom of God are kind of lovey, huggy, touchy people. And if you don't like to be touched, you'll have to get over it right now. Because these people that are standing are coming into the family of God. And if you're around one of these people, you're already born again, just reach out and touch their hand. Don't smother them. Put your hand on their shoulder. Hold their hand. Something, just, just show a little love there. Let's look around, make sure nobody's left out. Because if anybody gets left out, the devil will tell them, see, you got left out. We don't want that. <laughs> Amen. Now, I want us all to pray this prayer together so they're comfortable. And I want you to realize, those of you that are praying this prayer tonight, and you're sincere, I want you to realize something. Please understand this. You're giving your life away to the only person who really knows how to run it. <laughs> and it's not all going to be easy, but it's going to be a lot better than living a life of sin 
God never promises us a trouble-free life, but He does promise to never leave us nor forsake us. And I can tell you that your worst day with Jesus will be better than your best day without Him ever was. Amen? So you're making a commitment when you pray this prayer. Now let's pray. Father God, I love you. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. You shed your blood for me. Forgive me, for I am a sinner. But I'm sorry for my sins. And I repent of them. And I'm willing to turn away from a sinful life. Jesus, I receive you now. Come into my heart. Live inside of me. Give me that new nature. I want you. And I give myself to you. I surrender. Take me just the way I am. Now make me what you want me to be. I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm going to enjoy the journey. I'm saved. I'm born again. Amen. Well, if you needed salvation, I certainly hope that you just prayed that prayer with me. And if you did, it's the best decision that you've ever made in your whole life. You know, it's so important to know God, to have the peace of believing that we're right with God, and to have the hope of heaven. God loves you. He's ready to forgive your sins. All you have to do is invite him to come in. You know, here's the inspiring story of a man and his entire family who gave their life to Christ. And we have a gentleman here tonight that's going to share a testimony. That when Ron Rudman shared his testimony at the Joyce Meyer Conference in Denver, Colorado, he talked about his experience of the first time he saw one of Joyce's books. And it was clear that this was going to be a unique story to say the least at your picture on the cover of the book. And I'm sorry, I can't look you in the eye and tell you this, but I, I looked at your picture and I thought, what a hick. That is just too funny. As if that moment wasn't unique enough, it was everything that happened in his life up to that point that makes this story truly amazing. I was raised as a young Jew in the 1960s in the New York metropolitan area. I was raised in a reformed Jewish congregation and I, I was born into the first post-war generation of survivors of the Holocaust. I was bar mitzvahed at the age of 13 and I memorized a portion of the Torah. I had no idea what the words meant. No one even gave me an English translation. And it was all form and no substance. I, I felt as if I knew who God was, but I had no way to find him. I, uh, I tried Eastern religion for a while. I tried Buddhism, and that whole meditation thing didn't work for me. I, I tried transcendental meditation, and uh, that didn't, didn't improve my life. And uh, I, I majored in philosophy in college, thinking that, well, there's got to be some human knowledge. You know, these guys like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, they must have really found some foundational truths that would tell me how to, how to know who I was and how I was supposed to live. It was an empty search. Ron didn't spend all of his time searching for God. In the fall of 1977, he found his soulmate, Martha. Most of the guys that I went out with lived at home and had rock bands in the garage. So he was an entirely different animal. And I thought, well, that's rather nice. He opens doors and all that kind of stuff, you know? It was really, really, really nice. And he was very sweet and very smart. No, we didn't have a Jewish wedding. <laughs> We, we were married by a woman who is a minister of the Church of the Science of Mind. Don't ask me what that is. I can't tell you. 
uh, we were just looking for somebody who could legally marry us. The couple settled down and eventually had two kids, Ben and Claire. The Rudmans were a happy family, yet there was a deep sense that there was still something missing. In December 2005, I was shopping for a Christmas present for my wife, and I went into a bookstore, a big chain bookstore at a mall, and uh, we, we celebrated Christmas, but it was the happy holidays kind of Christmas, not the Merry Christmas kind of Christmas. And well, I was looking for a particular book for her, and the store was very crowded because it was the holidays, and they had set up extra display tables because they had a lot more stuff to push, and I knocked over a display table. So I picked up the books that I'd knocked over, and the very last book that I picked up for some reason, I looked at the cover and it said Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. And I looked at Joyce's picture on the cover of the book and my honest thought was, what a hick. This woman was obviously a Christian of some kind who was sending out some kind of Christian message. And I viewed Christians with contempt. I thought that they were people who wanted to believe so badly that they compromised what I thought was sound logic and reason and, uh, and, and fooled themselves, tricked themselves into believing that this whole story of theirs was true. And uh, so I, uh, I, I had a dismissive attitude and I went to put the book back down on the table, but for some reason uh, I picked it back up and I cracked it open and I opened it to the middle and the first words that I read were, the reason that you picked up this book is because the God who created you desires an intimate, personal relationship with you. So I kept reading. And then I bought the book and I brought it home. And when I brought it home, I hid it from my family because I didn't want them to see me reading it. I didn't want them to think that I had bought a, a Christian book and was giving this any credibility at all. And, uh, but I kept reading the book. And uh, in the book, Joyce Meyer quotes from the Amplified Bible. And I, I didn't own a Bible. So I went out and I bought an Amplified Bible and I brought that home and I hid that too. And kept reading it for a couple of weeks uh, on the sly. And then one afternoon I walked into our bedroom and my wife, Martha, was lying on the bed reading a Bible. And I, you know, she kind of felt a little sheepish and she said, oh, I, I didn't want you to see this. You know, she'd been hiding it from me. And uh, she said, you know, I know how you feel about this stuff. Uh, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, I, I really can't explain it, but for the last couple of weeks, I, I, just, I felt compelled to go down to the basement and dig up my old Bible and start reading it. When Ron realized I was reading the Bible, he felt safe to show me the Joyce Meyer book. And so he would read passages to me, and I would read passages to him from the Bible and say, look, in the Old Testament, it says the same thing as the New Testament. There's something's making sense here. And he would read me something that Joyce would say, and it would all blend together like, like cake batter. It was just a beautiful blend. Of the, of the truth. As Ron and Martha soon came to know that truth, it was easy to introduce their children to Jesus as well. Ben and Claire also gave their hearts to Christ. And just one year after Ron knocked over that stack of books, the entire Rudman family had come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. That day, Claire said, you know, it's unusual, I know for a whole family to get saved like this. But for us, it's like God said, Redmond, party of four, right this way. And our family has been transformed. We have, we have the love of God living inside of all of us through the Holy Spirit. So we relate to each other in entirely different ways. Before I got saved, I didn't really believe anything. I couldn't really string together more than two or three coherent sentences that explained my worldview. God explains to you through the Spirit who you are. 
and who you are to Him. Now that I finally know who I am, I could be a husband to my wife, I can be a father to my children, I can be a, an employee to my employer, I can be I, I, can, I can be who I was made to be rather than before. I had no idea who I was, really. I was always searching. Well, the Bible gave me a worldview that makes sense. And, and I thank God for it every day. My family and I are richly blessed with the truth now. Once you have the truth, it'll set you free, like the book says. Well, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him might not perish, but have everlasting life. What a beautiful scripture. You know, if you prayed the prayer of salvation with us today, we have a book that we'd like to give you as a free gift. It's called A New Way of Living. It's a book that I've written that will just help you begin this new journey with Christ properly, know some things to expect, kind of get, your, get yourself grounded in what your next step should be. So be sure that you contact us. If you have any other questions that we can answer, we'd be happy to do that regarding salvation or if we can pray for you in any other way. We love you, God bless you, and welcome to the kingdom of God. Embrace your new way of living with this free book from Joyce Meyer Ministries. Contact us today. Call toll-free 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. Celebrate with women from all over the world at the 2012 Love Life Women's Conference. Worship with Darlene Check, Carrie Job, Mandisa, and Fused Worship with challenging messages from Joel Osteen, Christine Kane, and Joyce Meyer. Come celebrate with us at the 30th Anniversary Love Life Women's Conference, September 20th through the 22nd in St. Louis, Missouri. Call or go online and register today. Well, like many of you, I've gone through some very emotionally painful situations in my life. If it wasn't for the power of forgiveness, I don't think I'd be standing here today. God forgives us and He gives us the grace to forgive others. In my new book, you'll find out you don't have to hang on to anger. You may feel it, but you don't have to keep it. You can do yourself a favor and forgive. Get my new book and find out how. Do yourself a favor, forgive. Now with New York Times bestseller. You mean more to us at Joyce Meyer Ministries than you may ever know. We appreciate you and we thank our friends and partners for making this worldwide ministry possible. Together, we're feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and presenting the gospel to the nations. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org today to share your prayer requests, find out more about our resources, see Joyce's conference schedule, and to join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.